I'm going to pass things over to our actual presenter, Russ Congleton, who will introduce himself. Great. Well, all right. Good afternoon, and thanks for uh, joining me on this uh, webinar, and I'm very pleased to be able to uh, do that. So my name is Russ Congleton, and I'm a professor here at the University of New Hampshire uh, in remote sensing and uh, GIS in the Department of Natural Resources uh, and the Environment. And I also happen to be the director of New Hampshire View, and uh, if you've never heard of America View, America View is a consortium of uh, states funded by a U.S. Geological Survey to promote the use of remote sensing and other geospatial technologies uh, within individual states. And so there's a Vermont view and a uh, Connecticut view, and I happen to be the director of uh, New Hampshire view. So uh, one of our things is to try to get as much uh, information out there to as many people as possible about uh, the uses of remote sensing. So anything I can do to help you, uh, feel free to email me. My email address is here at the bottom uh, of this slide. And uh, just tell me that you uh, met me through this webinar, and I'll be happy to uh, get back to you with any kind of information that I possibly can. So uh, as Leslie said, we're going to try to have three, at least three webinars on uh, some remote sensing information uh, through this uh, fall. And this one is just on basics. And so we'll uh, jump in here and get started. So, so what's remote sensing? Well, remote sensing is learning something about an object without touching it. It's the measurement of some property from some recording device where you're not intimately touching it. You're not in physical contact uh, with that. And the goal here is to obtain the most accurate information using the most appropriate sensor on the most practical platform. So you can see on the side here that there's a bunch of different ways we can remote sense. We can be you know, within a few feet or meters of an object. We can be uh, within a few miles of an object. We can be uh, in space and we can be hundreds of miles uh, away from the object. And there's trade-offs in that and we can talk about that a little bit. But basically learning something about an object uh, without being in direct contact with it. So what kind of remote sensing systems are there? Well, for human beings like you and me, we have our eyes, we have our ears, and we have our nose. And so right now you're remote sensing through listening to my uh, voice, but you're also remote sensing by looking at the slides uh, that you're seeing here. And then, uh, you know, your nose, you, you would have uh, the sense of smell. In this webinar and for remote sensing, we're typically talking about using our eyes. We're talking about electromagnetic energy, and we can put those um, sensors on satellites, or we can put them on airplanes, and we can use them from there. Okay, so you already have a lot of experience with that because you've used your eyes, you know, all the time. And then remote sensing systems basically have two components: one, the sensor themselves, the the thing that allows us to see, and then something to carry that sensor on, whether you know we have it in our hand or whether we put it on an airplane or whatever. So the two components of a remote sensing system. And the way this all works, as I mentioned already, is we're talking about electromagnetic energy. So um, you have a source of electromagnetic energy. And in most cases, we're talking about the sun as our source of electromagnetic energy. And that comes through the atmosphere and then hits particular objects and then is uh, either absorbed or reflected or transmitted by that object. Typically, we care most about what's reflected. And then you can see here the arrows going in the opposite direction, again, passing back through the atmosphere up to that sensor, which in this particular case is on a satellite. So. And again, electromagnetic energy. So you've known about this uh, you know, probably in kindergarten. Your teacher took a, a prism, and you went over by the window, and you divided the visible light into the uh, different colors of light. Uh, through the prism, but there's lots more to the electromagnetic spectrum than just visible light. In fact, if you look at this diagram here, you can see that visible light is a very, very, very small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. And we start over there at one end with, with gamma rays and then X-rays and then into the ultraviolet. Finally, hit the visible, 
Then we get into the near infrared and the middle infrared and finally into thermal or heat. And then we get into the real short wave um, energy like radars and eventually up there into uh, TV and radio waves. So um, kind of important that you have some general understanding of electromagnetic energy. And so again, here's the same basic diagram. And what you see at the bottom of this is um, film. And we'll talk a little bit about this. The, the, historically, uh, we had film long before we had any kind of digital sensors. And so we have uh, you know, over 100 years, maybe almost 150 years now of history of using um, films. And uh, much less than that, maybe 25 or 30 years uh, of really using uh, digital sensors. And so you can see that film tended to mimic what we could see in the visible portion of the spectrum, a little bit into the UV and a little bit into the near infrared, but now you see that a lot of these digital sensors that we're using uh, today extend that ability into much um, larger portions of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, and that's important for us to understand. So. And a little bit of physics, so you can remember what you learned in, uh, I don't know, ninth grade or tenth grade whenever you had a physics class, and so hopefully you remember this, but uh, no big deal if you don't. Wavelength is the distance between the peak wave or the trough of the wave or whatever. And so you can see here on this diagram, short wavelengths and long wavelengths. And frequency is simply the number of waves that pass by in a given period of time. And then we probably all remember that uh, light uh, or electromagnetic energy is a, uh, travels at a constant velocity or a constant speed. Uh, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, or 186,000 miles per second, travels very, very fast. Probably the most useful thing about this is that uh, frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional to each other. And so as one goes up, the other goes down. And so typically, if you know one, you know the other. Most remote sensing applications, and certainly everything that I'll talk about in the webinars here, uh, we'll be talking about wavelength. There are a few applications where uh, people talk about frequency. That, that happens in robotics. It happens in some artificial intelligence. It happens in some electrical engineering uh, applications where you get into Fourier transforms and, and the frequency domain. But uh, most remote sensing is done in the, in the wavelength domain. And again, if you know wavelength, you know frequency. If you know frequency, you know wavelength. So it works out perfectly fine. All right, probably the most important diagram that we're going to see today, and that's just, it's good to understand the physics, it's good to understand electromagnetic energy, but uh, we as remote sensors, what we're trying to do is understand what we're looking at. And so we're going to have this interaction between the objects that we care about and this electromagnetic energy. And so you can see here that, uh, imagine that arrow that's pointing towards the leaf you know, that's the electromagnetic energy coming from the sun. And then that leaf can do certain things with that light. Some of that electromagnetic energy or light is uh, absorbed by that leaf. And you guys know about vegetation. You know that um, uh, vegetation uh, photosynthesizes. It makes food by absorbing uh, electromagnetic energy through the chlorophyll in the leaf. And it absorbs the blue light and it absorbs the red light. And because of those lights, it's able to make that food and therefore, uh, you know, grow. And that's good. But it, uh, it reflects in the green, okay? And that's why leaves look green to us. Uh, we get a little bit of reflection in the green portion of the spectrum. So you can see here that, yes, portions of the spectrum are absorbed, portions are reflected, and then other wavelengths that we don't see in at all, other things might happen. There may be some transmission through the leaf. There may be... Uh, you know, other things that go on. And so if the leaf is healthy and the leaf is photosynthesizing, um, it's getting enough water, the stomates are open, it's a happy leaf, um, it's actually doing exactly what we see here, plus some other things that are actually very useful, especially in the near-infrared portion of the spectrum that we wouldn't see with our eyes, but we'll able, be able to see um, with the remotely sensed imagery, and we'll look at that right now. So this is called uh, a spectral pattern analysis, and it's basically a graph where you can see 
On the x-axis is the wavelength or that portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that we're interested in. And on the other axis, on the y-axis is, in this particular case, percent reflectance. This could also be percent transmittance if we were interested in that, or percent absorption if we were interested in that. But because we're remote sensing, remote sensing is you know, seeing what's going on with the light that's reflected off the object because that's what's coming into our eyes, or that's what's coming into the camera, or that's what's coming into the sensor. And so typically our spectral patterns are, call, are, are using uh, percent reflectance. And if you look at this, you can see that there are three different objects shown on here. There's a, an oak, an oak leaf, if you will, or an oak tree, a pine needle or a pine tree, and some concrete. I don't know why they threw concrete on here, but that's kind of interesting. And you can see, if you look in the visible portion of the spectrum, which goes from um, 0.4 microns up to 0.7 microns, you can see that there's that little peak in the green, and let me, if you can see my mouse right there, see here's the peak um, in the green. So here's blue portion of the spectrum, here's the green portion of the spectrum, and here's the red portion of the spectrum. So this is what we see with our eyes. Okay? And so as we've just described, for the healthy vegetation, whether it's hardwood or conifer, oak or pine, you can see that um, you got this absorption in the blue and the absorption in the red for photosynthesis and then this nice peak in the green. Um, and that's why we see leaves as green. But what's really, really interesting is what goes on after that, going into the near infrared. And you can actually see this um, really huge increase in this um, graph here in the near infrared portion of the spectrum. And that's because vegetation that's healthy vegetation that's growing and happy and content and well watered and all those good things um, gives off very, very high near-infrared reflectance. And in fact, we've used that in remote sensing for a very, very long time, something called pre-visual stress detection. The idea that um, vegetation that's healthy gives off near-infrared uh, energy and vegetation that's not healthy um, does not. Okay? And so Actually, you can tell if you look on a color infrared photograph or a color infrared image, if you're looking in the infrared portion of the spectrum, whether the vegetation is happy and healthy long before you could visibly tell just looking at the leaf or the needles uh, with our eyes. And in fact, in the old days, this was called, the color infrared film was called camouflage film because what they would do is you wanted to hide your tent or your tank or whatever it was you were interested in in hiding, you would cut branches off of a tree and put it over the top of the object. And if you took a picture of that in with color film, it looked like you just had a bunch of trees or a bunch of branches there. But nothing stresses a, a branch more than cutting it off the tree. And so the infrared portion of that branch, that reflectance, would drop very, very, very quickly. And so if you wanted to identify all those places where um, you, know, you were probably hiding your tanks or your tents or whatever you were trying to hide, you would, you would see that very quickly on this camouflage or color infrared uh, film. And so we still use that technology today. We, we use it all the time in agriculture and natural resources and lots and lots of applications. And so this is just one example of remote sensing beyond the wavelengths that our eyes typically see in. And then you can see with this graph that uh, it extends outward into the middle infrared uh, portions of the spectrum as well, and then there's other interesting things, you know, that happen there. So just another another uh, spectral pattern. Again, same kind of thing here. We have uh, rock and vegetation and snow. Okay, and so the the power here is if I want to tell these things apart, you can see that if I picked trying to tell rock and vegetation apart. You know, right here at whatever this is, about 1.2 microns, they're, they're, they actually are identical there. Okay, so that's not a wavelength I would want to pick to tell those two things apart. Okay, but let's say up here, 1.7 or so, I've got, you know, my vegetation way down here and my rock way up here, and so I've got this big separation between things. 
Okay? And so this is the power of having multiple wavelengths to be able to sense in uh, simultaneously. And actually in the next webinar that we do in November, we'll, we'll go into that. We'll talk about what, how the best, what, what kinds of characteristics you need to know to best select um, your imagery. And so this uh, spectral pattern analysis is actually a really nice tool. It's not difficult to understand. It graphically shows you what um, is being reflected or absorbed or transmitted off you know, that particular objects that you uh, have interest in. And here's just one last example of this. And this, this gets a little bit more complicated one, um, but not really, uh, not much different. But what you can see here is this is actually using Landsat data. And so the very first, the seven, instead of having the wavelength values, I just have the bands. And so we represent um, Landsat bands, um, different wavelengths by number. And so the band one in Landsat thematic mapper is blue, and band two is green, and band three is red, and band four is near infrared, and band five is middle infrared, and band six is middle infrared, and band seven is thermal. And then 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 on here are actually combinations or derivative bands generated by ratioing or doing some kind of manipulation of the original raw seven bands on the Landsat satellite. And so what that allows us to do is try to get even more combinations of things where we can tell uh, things apart. So that, that becomes really interesting to us. And again, you can see you know, kind of some separation here. If you're trying to tell some things apart, you get a lot of grouping going on here. But obviously, water, you know, is significantly different than most of the vegetation that's going on here. And you can see that in some places, you get something that's very low in band three, this yellow line here. And then when you switch, it gets higher in band four. And so there's this pattern analysis that you can really learn a lot about what's going on. So that's a powerful tool and a kind of a basic in remote sensing that we use these spectral pattern analysis um, techniques all the time. So, all right, we talked a little bit about platforms. Again, I mentioned this and want to make sure everybody's feeling good about that. You know, there's all kinds of different platforms. You can be, you know, just very, very close to the object, but still remote from it, not touching it. That's that's still remote sensing. So if you got a handheld camera and you're a foot from the, the needles of the tree and you take a picture, that's remote sensing. If you get in a, a bucket truck or a tower and you're just a little bit above the canopy, that's absolutely still remote sensing. Or you get in a you know, little Cessna airplane or something with your friend and you fly along and you're you know, a thousand feet above the ground, totally fine. Or you, know, you get in a, you know, one of these high altitude airplanes now where you're flying at 60,000 feet, that's fine too. And you can have it in a satellite and it could be orbiting the space shuttle 100 miles above the Earth's surface or you know, some of our other satellites that are three, four, five, six hundred miles above the Earth's surface. Okay. As I mentioned uh, earlier, the, this whole idea of analog versus digital. Okay, So the image on this side here, this is an aerial photograph. And an aerial photograph is just using film. Okay? And this happens to be an area in Oregon. Um, and on this side is a digital image of the same area. So you can see, like right in here, this is some riparian habitat. So there's some nice water in here. And so you've got nice, dense vegetation. Water happens to be a fairly limiting factor um, in Oregon. And then on this side here, you can see that the vegetation is much sparser. You come over here, you can see the exact same thing. Here's the riparian habitat, the dense vegetation. Here's the sparse area. Now, historically, aerial photography had nicer resolution, had higher resolution, something we were very used to seeing. And digital, especially digital satellite imagery, um, had grosser resolution, had this kind of pixelated, if you will, or fuzziness to it. It didn't have the same amount of detail. That is no longer true. Okay? And when, as we go through these webinars, I'll show you more examples of that, especially next time, where you'll see very, very detailed uh, digital imagery. And you guys know that because of even the, you know, the, I think you can get a, a cell phone now that's 45 megapixels or some, you know, ridiculous amount of um, data that's captured 
um, digitally. And so all the imagery that you see in the news, the things you see on Google Earth and those kinds of things, you'll see high resolution digital data. But historically, this was the situation. So until 10, 15 years ago, um, typically if you wanted high resolution, nice detail, you flew aerial photography. If you wanted more gross resolution covering larger areas, you tended to um, buy digital data. Again, we, we've changed that radically at this point. So, all right, why why do we want to use remote sensing? You know, why maybe why are you on this webinar? What do you want to learn from this? And typically, we use remote sensing because it's cheaper than going to the ground. Okay, and there's a trade-off there. When you go to the ground, you can learn everything you want to because you're directly in contact with what you want to know. When you use remote sensing, you're not in direct contact, and so there's a trade-off. Now, go, using remote sensing doesn't eliminate completely going to the ground. What you really want to do is correlate what's going on in the remote sensing to places that you visited on the ground. So there will be some sampling involved in still going to the ground, and that's very, very important. And in fact, that's where I've spent most of my career is making sure that um, the maps that we make from remote sensing are accurate and what kinds of tools we could use uh, to do that. Secondly, it provides what we call a bird's eye view or a synoptic view or a view from above, and there's some real power in being able to do that. Thirdly, and we've talked about this already, it can sense in wavelengths beyond what our eyes can see it. And hopefully uh, you've already gotten that from the example of the near infrared and the power, especially for natural resources, for vegetation health, for agriculture, for these kinds of things in um, determining health of that uh, vegetation and the near infrared portion for that. And then it also, lastly, allows for various spatial and temporal scales. So sometimes you need lots of detail, so you have really high spatial resolution. Sometimes you can take a, a sort of an overview of the whole area and then maybe dig into only certain pieces of it. Okay, so you have various spatial resolutions. And again, next time our webinar is really dedicated to talking a lot about that. And then also we have various temporal scales. Temporal meaning time. So some things we might need you know, once a year. We might need some imagery or once every five years. We might need some imagery and other things we may need um, you know, every day. You know, we have a flood situation. We need it every hour, you know, that kind of thing. So it's a trade-off. So lots and lots of good reasons for using remotely sensed data. Just from a historical uh, perspective, as I said, you know, aerial photography for probably the last 150 years ago, since the 1860s or so, okay, first aerial photos were taken from, from balloons and actually even used in the Civil War um, way back then really an explosion of knowledge about aerial photography and photo interpretation coming out of World War II, some in World War I, but certainly coming out of World War II, especially this idea of, of color infrared photography or camouflage photography and, you know, all these uh, soldiers returning home from the war and uh, they have all these skills and we got to figure out what they're going to do with them. And so they applied them to natural resources, they applied them to agriculture, they applied them to um, insect infestation mapping and you know all these different things and so really really interesting stuff. The first satellites really weren't around until the 1960s and those were really weather satellites. It's kind of mind-boggling that uh, you know hurricane prediction and, and tornadoes and those kinds of things really weren't even available to us until uh, the 1960s or so. And then 1972, the launch of Landsat uh, called the Multispectral Scanner, or MSS, and we'll look at that a little bit in a couple of minutes. Um, so 1972, the first satellite launched to really look at the Earth's resources. Second generation of Landsat satellites called Thematic Mapper, or TM, launched in 1982, called Landsat 4, so the fourth Landsat satellite. Uh, other countries starting to get involved, including the French, a satellite called SPOT. You can still buy SPOT data today. And then other satellites, including additional weather satellites uh, like ADHRR. Then we get to the 90s, and in the 90s we still we start to get some digital airborne camera systems, okay, just rudimentary camera systems. We get into some other wavelengths of electromagnetic energy, including 
um, active sensors like radar. Other countries are getting involved. Uh, uh, certainly the, the Japanese, the Canadians, the European Space Agency. IRS is the Indian Remote Sensing Group um, and a very, very active group. And then actually some cool stuff as far as releases of classified data. So the Soviet Union had uh, you know, a bunch of spy data that they collected in the United States, and the United States had a bunch of spy data that was collected in the 50s and 60s flying over the Soviet Union, and a lot of that data was released. And then a whole bunch of failed launches, a whole bunch of uh, uh, commercial as well as government-based uh, satellites trying to be launched and actually not very successfully. Either the uh, rocket would explode or um, the satellite would get into orbit and fail to uh, deploy properly, all, all kinds of really horrendous issues there. Leading into the 2000s, in the early 2000s, a bunch of new satellites successfully deployed, uh, pretty cool, some really high spatial resolution imagery, and again, we'll talk more about that next time, and significant improvements in airborne digital cameras, and then something that I'm sure you've all heard of called LiDAR, which has essentially replaced aerial photography for generating um, elevation data or topographic data, and has done an amazing job with that. And then in the last four or five years or so, significantly increased higher spatial resolution and spectral resolution data. So um, more detail and more wavelengths, extensive use of LIDAR data, and I'm sure you're involved in that. Something called hyperspectral, which hyperspectral we're talking about hundreds of wavelengths of electromagnetic energy instead of just 5 or 10 or 20 like we have with the multispectral instruments. And then lastly, something that's really come down and gotten popular in the last year or so is uh, unmanned aerial systems or unmanned aerial vehicles, depending on whether you have a remote sensing system on that and then you have the vehicle. So again, the same kind of thing. You've got to have the, the sensor and something to control it with. And so uh, UAS has become a, a great big deal and uh, starting to play with that uh, somewhat myself. All right. So here's just a general idea of some sensor types. This is not an exclusive list or a, an exhaustive list, but uh, they're just kind of the things we're talking about. So a bunch of different weather satellites or, or satellites that have kind of global coverage. So AVHRR I mentioned, SPOT uh, vegetation I mentioned, MODIS, which is a NASA satellite, and you can see that these have large pixels, large, um, fairly gross coarse resolution, okay, a kilometer or larger type of thing. And then you get into these regional satellites where Landsat falls into this, some of the other spot satellite data falls into this, and those sensors have been around now for 20, 25, 30 years. And then we get into um, the real high spatial resolution data, the things that you're kind of used to seeing when you get to Google Earth, things like QuickBird and Iconos, okay, uh, where you get pixel sizes of a meter or, you know, we're down to about uh, six-tenths of a meter now at this point. And then we have airborne instruments, and there's a lot, a lot of those beyond these three um, that are listed here. Um, but these would be flying on airplanes and uh, digital sensors that uh, some are hyperspectral and some are um, just multispectral. So it's gotten a little crowded out there, and uh, this is uh, you know a rendering of what it looks like, and that's not all just remote sensing satellites. There's you know as you know lots of communication satellites and spy satellites and all kinds of other things up there. But uh, it's kind of amazing when you think about it. Uh, you know if somebody was at the moon now, as opposed to when they landed on the moon in the late '60s, um, you know it would be really interesting uh, for them to see all these satellites going overhead. So, All right, I just wanted to conclude uh, today's uh, basics with a little bit about Landsat. Landsat is, is such a gem. It's such an amazing thing that uh, we have, and it's such a nice source uh, for you to be able to use that I wanted to tell you a little bit about it. And so we've got this nice continuity of a data set that's been collected from 1972 onwards. Okay, the first three Landsats had the multispectral scanner on them, and then, as I said, in 1982, second generation of Landsat with increased um, detail and increased number of wavelengths 
on Landsat 4 and Landsat 5. Unfortunately, Landsat 6 was one of those late uh, 90s, one of those 90s launches, 1993, and it's actually uh, sensing in somewhere in the Marianas Trench at this point, so uh, not doing us any good. And so quickly, as quickly as we could, got Landsat 7 up there. And then very, very exciting um, last year, Landsat 8, and plans now for Landsat 9 and Landsat 10 going on. One of the most exciting things, and you may or may not have heard about this, but in 2008, the U.S. Geological Survey made a policy decision to make all Landsat data ever collected free to anybody who wanted to download it. And so the ability to start doing multi-temporal analysis, to have many, many different uh, images of the same area over a growing season or over a number of years has become easy for us to do, especially in academia, but, but so, certainly also in uh, you know, government and, and private industry to have this data and be able to do amazing things uh, with it. So I want to make sure you're uh, up to speed on that. So here's just a little bit about Landsat MSS, really an amazing instrument launched in 1972. If you look on the diagram here, you can see this was supposed to be the instrument of choice, something called the return beam Viticon. And at the same time, they put this experimental device on this unit called the multispectral scanner. And as it turned out, the return beam Viticon never worked at all. Uh, but the multispectral scanner, which they really didn't know what it was going to do, has turned into just this amazing success. And so, whoops. Don't know how that happened. I'm really sorry. Uh, that was not planned, but let me get back to where I was. So, almost there. There we go. Sorry about that. I must have hit the mouse funny. Anyway, um, the Landsat MSS had four wavelengths that it sensed in, in the green, the red, and two in the near-infrared portion of the spectrum. And it had fairly high, um, large spatial resolution, 80-meter pixels, so fairly large pixels, almost the size of a, a football field. Okay? And so this is 1972 technology, but you can see that it got us into the infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, and that was pretty exciting. Landsat 4, as I mentioned, was launched in 1982. This is called the Thematic Mapper, or TM. And instead of having the four bands that multispectral scanner had, it had seven bands. And for the first time, it could sense in the blue portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So not only could we get a color infrared image from thematic mapper, but we could also get a natural color image. So we could mimic what a typical aerial photograph or a typical photo that you, you and I would be used to seeing uh, would look like. In addition, it also sensed into the middle infrared for the first time, and thermal infrared, which is heat. And so we could start doing applications in like uh, volcano mapping and forest fires and you know heat kinds of things. And also, uh, at the same time, it increased the, um, the amount of detail. Instead of 80-meter pixels, now we're talking about 30-meter pixels. So lots and lots and lots of advantages of Landsat. So 1982 onward, we've had um, Landsat thematic mapper data available to us. And so we can do things like this. This is just a really quick um, shot at what you can see. But here's Las Vegas from MSS data, so Landsat data in 1972. And you can see how small Las Vegas was in 1972. And then the same place in 2010. And uh, pretty amazing what has happened there. So. These are the kinds of change analyses, things that we can do very, very quickly with the remotely sensed data. And then very exciting, in February of last year, uh, Landsat 8 was launched. And Landsat 8 has actually two instruments on it, the Operational Land Imager, or OLI, and, and then the Thermal uh, Remote Sensing Sensor. It has two different wavelengths of thermal data on it. So together, that forms 10 different wavelengths of electromagnetic energy instead of the seven that Landsat um, five and four and seven were sensing in. Okay? And again, all this data is freely available. And here's one of the first images that was uh, collected by the Landsat eight 
and you can see the different uh, wavelengths that are listed here. Um, what I just mentioned, there's a new one in the um, shorter blue wavelength that helps us look at aerosols, and then the typical blue, green, red, near infrared. There's a new band that looks at uh, cirrus clouds, which are hard to see on the imagery, and so this helps us uh, identify that. And then we've got some near infrared or short wave infrared bands, and then uh, the thermal infrared bands. So. so I'm hoping that you got um, something out of the talk today and that uh, you're now a little more introduced to remote sensing and the basics than you ever have been before. And I'm hoping, uh, I hope, uh, open to answering any questions that you might have and hope that you'll come back and hear a little bit more in November about the best uh, imagery to select for your particular application and then back in December for looking at uh, accuracy assessment. So I'll turn it back over to Leslie at this point to moderate any questions that we might have. Okay. Thanks, Russ. So now is your chance to ask questions, everyone. Um, I haven't received any yet because I think you did a very good job of, of uh, covering that, actually. It was very helpful Everybody to me. <laughs> well, I figure that's how everyone feels at the end of a webinar, <laughs> so mm -hmm. information overload. It was helpful for me because I've never had an overview of this stuff. I've only picked up the little bit that I could pick up on my own. Good. Uh, let's see. All right, here's a question about the future of the Landsat program. So what, what comes up after Landsat 8? Are there any plans yet? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, uh, uh, yeah. The, the issue with Landsat is that it's never been a program, so it's sort of a, a one-off. So you know yeah. how we are in the United States. We yeah. get very excited about things, and then um, once we've done it, we're, we're kind of sick of it, and then we move on to something else. And so it's been a challenge you know, since 1972 to get money each time to build a new Landsat program. But uh, recently, there's been a whole bunch of effort to do that. So. Uh, there's a study right now going into looking at what it would take to build Landsat 9 and Landsat 10, and uh, the federal government, Congress, the president's office, everybody is, is on board with this, and obviously the Department of Interior, USGS, and uh, NASA, and, and NOAA, all, all the different agencies that work with this um, have really come together. So we're pretty optimistic that we're going to have a, the you know, the money's been allocated at this point for this study, and um, it looks like we're pretty optimistic that there'll be money allocated to start planning Landsat 9 pretty quickly here. Landsat 7, although it's not been up there for that long, um, actually has a, a, a small failure associated with it that um, you get data, but you don't get a complete image. You get some... Uh, lines in the data set. Oh, and so what was, what's been amazing is that, um, that uh, one of the Landsat satellites, Landsat 5, actually its, its life was supposed to be three to five years and it lasted 26 years. Wow. And so we had data long, longer than we ever thought we would um, from that. And then luckily we got Landsat 8 up there and Landsat 8's doing great. So. great. so that's a really good question. And anything you can do towards making more people aware of this and saying, yeah, this is a need. We've pretty much decided that Landsat type data, the resolution of Landsat is a, is a public good. Mm -hmm. It's not something that people need to pay for. It's something that we need to produce for the knowledge that we need to have to understand our world. And mm -hmm. because of that, you know, we need to convince Congress uh, and our representatives to fund these kinds of things. But uh, I think we're doing pretty good with that right now. So excellent okay. question. Okay. Um, okay. There is a quick question that I can't answer, which is, will you make the PowerPoint available on the Vermont GIS website? So that's a yes. And maybe at the very end, before we shut down, I can go back to my website and just show where that will be posted. But yes, that will be posted in the event archive at the VCGI website. And then we have another question about the satellites. Um, can you talk about the shift to smaller satellites, a la DMC? What's the potential there, asks Christiana. Uh, 
Yeah, good, good. So that's a great question too. So uh, the Europeans are coming online with a whole bunch of what were called small sats or small satellites, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, Landsat is sort of the Cadillac or Mercedes or you know whatever your car of choice is that's top of the line, and you know has kind of set the pace. It's the gold standard, if you will, uh, for a long, long time. Uh, I think there's lots of opportunity for some of these other satellites to do um, lots of things. They're less expensive to build, they're less extensive to launch, and one of the coolest things about them is we may be able to have you know, 8 or 10 or 12 of them in orbit simultaneously, and so you've got better repeat coverage. If you, if you come back next time in November, we'll talk about the temporal resolution of Landsat. It only passes over the same place every 16 days, and so with one satellite, we've got to wait 16 days. If that area was cloudy that day, then you know you don't have any imagery maybe for a whole month or something. So um, yes, there are some trade-offs there. There are some things, you know, depending on what you're trying to do with that data, how academic you are, how how practical you are, which wavelengths they sense in, um, the 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 fidelity of the data. So there are trade-offs there. Uh, but there's certainly large potential for small sats to help us out. So we're, we're very much looking forward to that. Great. So. Um, there's another question uh, from Peter who missed a part of the talk regarding the damage to plant and reflectivity and asks if you can recap that briefly. Sure, sure. So the big thing here is that um, in the near-infrared portion of the spectrum, vegetation that's healthy gives off very high near-infrared reflectance. You might, if you look in the literature, you'll see this referred to as the as the red edge. And if you look at that diagram, you'll see that there's this big peak that happens there. And so vegetation that's healthy gives off high near-infrared reflectance. Vegetation that's stressed drops in near-infrared reflectance long before it's visibly apparent in the blue, green, and red portions of the spectrum. So using color infrared or using the near-infrared wavelengths with a, a satellite or a digital sensor is going to reveal vegetation stress long before we would be able to visibly see it, even if we were standing right next to the tree. And that's been well known since the, you know, since the 60s. Mm -hmm. so, and, and, you know, if you look at, if you even Google searched and just typed in, you know, vegetation stress or something, you, you would find Wikipedia explanation of what I'm at, what I'm talking about there, Peter. That would be fine. Okay. And then Nina asks, um, do you know if anyone has come up with a way to identify trees by genus yet using remote sensing? Ooh. So that I mean that gets tricky, and um, probably the best opportunities there are with hyperspectral data, uh, because hyperspectral data gives us lots more wavelengths of energy to look in. And so I've been part of some work here at the University of New Hampshire where we used hyperspectral data in Harvard Forest and we were able to identify oh, about 15 or so different tree species. And and so not just conifers but able to separate out the hemlocks wow. from, the, from the pines with the hyperspectral data. Actually looking at the lignin and cellulose concentrations in the needles, and that work was done by uh, Dr. Mary Martin as part of her um, dissertation work here um, about oh, maybe 10 years ago now. Um, so if you wanted to email me, I, I could send you a, a paper about that, but there's, if you just, again, Google search that, you would find uh, many, many papers in the research on that. So, Nina has a second question. Okay. which is, uh, what would you recommend for free imagery that would be useful for local construction projects? <laughs> and I will say that Nina is from VTrans, so the type of construction projects she's talking about are highway and road construction projects. Sure, yeah, well, that's pretty tough. Mm. So, um, <laughs> and you want really high-resolution imagery, you, you probably want metric camera imagery, so you want calibrated camera imagery. Um, so, I mean, most of the engineering kinds of requirements require you to fly your own photography that you would then use specifically for that purpose. Perhaps the closest you could come to that are is some aerial photography, digital aerial photography, 
that's flown these days called NAIP imagery, N-A-I-P, the National Agricultural Image Program. Um, and they have one meter data, um, usually blue, green, red, and near infrared. The federal government pays for that. Um, and it's flown every couple of years in every state in the United States. It's leaf on because it's agricultural things. And so that may not be super great for you because of what you're looking for. But that's probably the closest that you're ever going to come for free. So well, I'll augment that question by just saying, do you think there's anything that would be better than the half meter leaf off imagery that this our state, Vermont, actually collects um, that is freely available. The time frame is more like on a five-year cycle. Right, yeah, so that's probably the best imagery yeah, that you're going to get your hands on. I was wondering if there was anything Unless, else. Unless, um, I mean, there are aerial survey firms, for instance, in New Hampshire, there's a company called Eastern Topographics in Wolfboro, um, New Hampshire, and they, you know, they fly some imagery uh, on spec, and so mm -hmm. it may be sitting in their library, and so you may find oh. that they've already flown uh, a piece of your area. You know, it's sort of Murphy's Law of mapping that they fly <laughs> right. three quarters of what you need and not all of it, but, um, you know, so it's worth looking at the different mm -hmm. aerial survey companies, in, you know, in and around Vermont that may have flown something that's uh, useful for you. So yeah, that's I interesting. I didn't know they did that on spec. Yeah, they often do. Yeah. So. And then a final question, I think, unless anybody wants to send in more. Uh, Nancy asks, was the image for, it's a little cluttered out there, with the satellite surrounding the globe, was that a real image? Is that an actual image no, showing? No, that's an artist's art oh, okay. rendition of what's going on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that wasn't real. Sorry about that. <laughs> just, wanted, just wanted to clarify that. Yep, yep, yeah. All right. Well, we I think we made it through all the questions, unless anybody wants to throw in a last. Oh, there's a bunch of thank yous. Great. <laughs> thank in. you. Appreciate everybody attending. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and let me just make sure there's a hand raising. Oh, I think he's just... All right. I think everybody's just thrown in their thank yous. Um, so, yes, I will add my thank you. Thank you very much, Russ, for doing this. I look forward to next week, right, or the week after? No. Uh, I'm a few weeks ahead. November A couple 6th. weeks. Three yep. weeks. One, two. Three weeks. Three, yeah, weeks. three weeks. And um, and so we look forward to our next, our next uh, webinar on November 6th. And just in case anybody else missed it, this uh, webinar is being recorded, has been recorded, will be posted at the VCGI YouTube page. And um, so if you go to our web page, you'll see a link to our YouTube page right on that front page in the lower left. And it will get posted sometime in the next week. And then also if you go to our web page and go to the events section of the web page and then into the events archive and then into the webinar section of that page, you will see a listing for this and it will have a link to Russ's PowerPoint that we just saw as well. So thank you again, Russ. And if anybody has any additional questions, you can send them to Russ or you can send them to me and I will pass them along. And I think that's it. Whoops. And I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you.